Culture and Leadership Connections and Daily Greatness Planner have joined forces. I have been using the Daily Greatness Planner for three years now and can't imagine a week without it. A paper planner has a physically solid reassurance about it that I really need in this digital age of endless Zoom meetings and physical distancing. There are planner versions for every type of person, job, business, and lifestyle. They all help you achieve your goals and keep you accountable. Daily Greatness Planners feature a soft cover, stay open binding, paper that is such a pleasure to write on you can just hear it calling to you, multiple check-in tools, note pages, inspirational fill-in-the-blank questions, affirmations, and more. I love that it is offered in several countries, so you don't have to pay ridiculous shipping and duty fees. Even better, if you subscribe to the Daily Greatness Tips when ordering your planner, you get 10% off your first order. To choose your planner and access your discount, go to shiftworkplace.com and click on Toolkits. Daily Greatness Planner will pop up right away. That is shiftworkplace.com, click on Toolkits, and you'll see Daily Greatness Planner and all the great options right in front of you. Enjoy! Hello, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. I have a great surprise for you today. Our guest, Janine Brisebois, is a successful entrepreneur and business professional with decades of personal success. Her studies in psychology, neurology, and communication allowed her to dedicate her life serving people as a rehabilitation counselor, educator, and registered massage therapist. She's also a successful business and sales and training person for the past 20 years, a speaker, a facilitator, author, and someone who will touch your heart and open your mind to endless possibilities. Janine was just telling me about her amazing experience growing up on the farm and understanding animals from the inside out. And I just kind of would like to start with that, Janine, but first, welcome to the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here, Marie. Oh, I'm excited to have you here too. So the, you were starting to tell me this story that I was absolutely enthralled with, and it was the story about on the farm with you holding a warm heart and understanding brains from firsthand experience because of working with animals. So can you talk some more about that? <laughs> I certainly can. Um, growing up on the farm was really the basis for many of the things that I have done in my life. And we lived on a farm that had animals. They were our foundation to survival. And that meant that we had to butcher our own animals. And for many people, that might sound like something very gory. But for myself, that was a time of great learning. I was so curious. And when we had the animals, as you said, from the inside out, I'd never actually thought of it that way. Um, but looking at the animal and seeing the musculature there and being able to see how the animal was in its very naked state. And I remember holding a warm beef heart in my hand and thinking, how amazing this group of muscles were to keep this huge animal alive. And we also occasionally would take the lungs and watch how they could be expanded and contracted. And my father was phenomenal at answering questions in a respectful manner. He didn't know the answers. He, he was a farmer and he wasn't a, a neurologist or psychologist or didn't understand the absolute workings, but it gave me enough desire to just peek asking more questions. And so on around age 12, I started massaging people and I was really trying to understand what happened in an individual and compare that to what I had touched in the animals that we had butchered. So did the muscles feel the same way? Were they moving in the same manner? What 
type of, were they large, like, you know, was a thigh large on a human as it was in the, the cow? And of course, the cow's thigh has many parts to it, and so does the human. And so understanding how we can experience the body in a way that gave some kind of feedback was really important to me. And from there, you went on to study massage therapy, right? No, I actually no. didn't. No. When I graduated from high school, massage therapy was not seen as an honorable profession. And so I wasn't allowed to take massage therapy. And where I ended up was that I went to university and I took a degree in science where I studied psychology. And in that particular program, we actually studied the nervous system and the brain. And so I got to work with human brains. We had sliced up human brains in, in an effort to understand you know, how brains were put together and how they connected with the rest of the body. But what you didn't know was how the mind connects to the brain. And you were already versed in that because of your experiences with animals and with massaging people. Yes, I, I hadn't really considered the difference between mind and brain on ever, really, because for me, one needed the other in order to perform properly. Mm -hmm. So you were in the science degree, and you did a lot of work with the brains. And what happened then? So then I became a rehabilitation counselor working with the Workers' Compensation Board. And my job was to help injured workers get back to a productive life. Right. And through working with them, I began, I guess, without really recognizing it or planning it, using them as my subjects. Why was it that some of them would be in pain for a long time and others could come in, they'd be injured for a short period of time and they'd go back to work and seemingly everything was fine. And that really created great curiosity in me. And I began asking the same type of questions to each injured worker that I was in charge of. And there was a very particular question that came to light that indicated whether or not they would successfully return to work. And that question was, tell me what your first thought was when the injury occurred. The answer that they gave me was consistent with the length of time that they were on benefits or that they required benefits. Interesting. Oh, I have a, a terrible confession story to tell you. <laughs> my daughter, who is now um, in her 30s, my youngest daughter, and it, when she was five, we were driving somewhere. And um, I had to put the brakes on suddenly because there was a woman who suddenly crossed the street in the middle of the road, and I didn't want to hit her. And the person behind me hit the car and folded my car like an accordion. And I hated that car because it was a lemon. I was in the garage with that stupid car every single a month, sometimes two, two times a month. And I was just wanting to get rid of it so badly. And my first thought, instead of thinking about my daughter, my first thought was, thank God, I hate this car. And <laughs> then I thought, oh, no, how's my daughter? And I was so ashamed that I thought it in that order that I, I turned beet red uh, and nobody heard it but my own thoughts. And I thought, oh, my God, what kind of a mother am I? <laughs> I wasn't. Oh, except that, Marie, the good thing is that you got rid of the one problem that you could get rid of, and then you could focus on the real problem, which was your daughter. <laughs> well, my daughter was not hurt, and neither, neither was I. Um, we both had a slight whiplash, so we were fine, and, there was, and we recovered within a couple of weeks, no problem. But it was, just, uh, it was just very funny. And then I actually got a phone call from an insurance company, and I said, you know, we're just fine. And he says, what do you mean you're just fine? And don't you want to make a claim and blah in case something happens? And he goes, no. And I said, no, I don't want to take advantage of the system. I had a minor injury and it's gone. And he said, you're the first person who's ever said that to me. And I've been in this job for 15 years. Wow. 
How, what a sad testament. It um, was. It was. Of society at large. Well, well, first I was mad at myself for think, being happy about losing the car instead of wondering how my daughter's safety was. And then the second thing was just getting that surprise thing that I was the first person who'd ever said that to him. I said, well, you know, it's, you can record it if you like. I'll even say it again. I don't want any money for this. My injury is gone. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I interrupted you with that sudden flashback memory. But uh, <laughs> so this question that you ask, what kinds of answers did you get from people when you said, you know, what was the first thought? Like, what kinds of things would, would they say? Well, you're asking me to go back a period of time here. Um, some of the questions were, I thought my life was over. Mm -hmm. Others were, damn it, I don't have time for this. Ah, yes. Um, and everything in between. between. So the ones and that recovered quickly, what, were there some patterns that you noticed? I noticed that they were the ones that were upset with getting injured in oh. terms of how it would impact their focus on their work. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones who wanted a new career or a different life or were under unbelievable stresses, perhaps they were being bullied at work or they weren't happy with their environment, they're the ones that never went back. Mm -hmm. But did they recover? Never fully. Interesting. Huh. Well, uh, this is very cool. Um, although the, the things that you're telling me, I'm just very interested in this. Why don't we go back a little bit further and uh, tell me a, about a couple of one or two incidents from your childhood. You already told me one about working on the farm with your dad and with butchering animals and being very curious about how anatomy works. Um, is there another incident from your childhood that you think really determined your life trajectory a little bit, you know, made you into that person you are today? Well, there are several. One was personal in that I was born with a medical condition. And so I spent some time away from our family in the hospital without anybody else around because in the day it was, you know, out of sight, it was out of mind for children. And I was quite young, and I remember looking around this big room filled with other sick kids that other children were not experiencing things the same way I was. There were some children there that were far sicker than I was, and there were some that seemed to be far better than I was. And I wanted to know more about those kids. And I was little, and I remember that room. And I remember looking around. And so I think that pattern of curiosity began when I was quite little. And when my two youngest sisters, I'm from a family of eight children, when my two youngest sisters drove a car into the dugout, they nearly drowned. And that whole experience was quite profound as we were pulling the vehicle out, now with the girls were already safe and everybody was gathered near the dugout as we were pulling the vehicle out. And I recall that there we had geese on the farm and these geese were always noisy and they were on the other end of the dugout and they were quiet. Hmm. They were observing, they were watching it and not making a sound. And they stayed there the entire time from the moment that we were there to get the girls out of the car and the whole process of getting the car out. And so I was curious why that would change their behavior. What was it about us gathering together in this time of stress that even impacted the geese? Well, it would have impacted them because they could sense the danger mm -hmm. and the worry and the stress and the concern and the single-minded focus. But to that point, for me, they were just birds. Right. They were just food. Yeah. Right. And yet they could sense. So that again took me to a different level of curiosity. You are a true scientist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have a definition for that? <laughs> a true scientist has insatiable curiosity about the world around them, and each discovery leads to yet another mystery to uncover. There, that's my definition. What do you think? I love it. That's, that's, <laughs> you, you got me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
those are really interesting. Not that many people have that a degree of self-reflection to be able to explain these things at, at that level of depth. So I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with this. It's so super interesting. So then where did this lead afterwards? What, you know, like, where did you go from there? Where did I go from once I was a rehabilitation counselor? No, I'm just thinking sort of just in between. So, I mean, you had all these profound oh, okay. experiences, right? And then before you became a rehabilitation counselor, just what was that little link in there? And then I'll have more questions, but just what happened in between time? Any interesting incidents that came uh, during that time when you're older, like a young adult or an adolescent? Hmm. It may come to you later. Okay. So you were born into a rural community, into a farming community, right? Yes, I was. All right. And mm-hmm. so, and, and probably into a French Canadian family. Yes, French Canadian family. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were surrounded by French communities mm-hmm. a distance away from us, but the community that we were linked to was an English community. Mm. And back in the day, that was a very difficult time for my mother because apparently there was a lot of discrimination against French people. And though my parents never really spoke much about it when I was a young child, there was a sense of needing to always go to the town further away because it was more French-based. And in fact, that's where we did our grade one to eight years. And that's actually another interesting thing that happened in my life is that I grew up in a one-room schoolroom. Right. (laughs) Grade one to eight in one classroom. We had no kindergarten, um, and there were four of us in grade one. (laughs) But but you don't seem like most people who have that story are much older than you. I know. (laughs) So, uh, but that's the way that it was for us. And so the fact that we were French and we were rather uh, somewhat isolated because we were in an English community. And I think that really impacted some of the social activities that we partook in. You mean within the English community or that you went further out to participate in French activities? we would go further out. Well, the mm-hmm. discrimination against the, the first French Canadian communities is well known. It's, there was discrimination against every cultural group that came in in any kind of numbers, right, in Alberta. So the Ukrainians experienced discrimination. The Italians experienced discrimination. They're all they're the Amber Valley and related stories about the um, black Canadians who, who came up from slavery from the United States who experienced discrimination. And, uh, and the French Canadians experienced, like every single group, it was like, oh, you're different. Let's keep you out, right? And for linguistic minorities, that became a defining feature of who they were. Mm-hmm. having to stand up against the majority and to fight for their rights. Uh, you know, even now when it's not necessary anymore, people still feel that way, uh, even if they're two or three generations removed from it, even. Uh, but that's typical of uh, linguistic minorities. I remember thinking that I just wanted to be curious about how come there was this rift. And I guess that's how I see discrimination as well is, I, when I look at you because you're different, it's not because I'm discriminating against you. I'm simply curious. You truly are curious. That's not discrimination. Discrimination is a prejudgment of someone where you force them into some preconceived idea of, that you think they are. But when you're truly curious, it's liberating. People love it when someone's curious about them. They want to respond. It's, a, a curiosity is authentic. So you grew up sort of in the French Canadian community, but then also kind of straddling into that English-speaking dominant community that you were living in as well, right? Yes, and the interesting thing that with that too is that the people that were all in the French community, there was also discrimination from them against us. Our French wasn't good enough, you know, and your children aren't going to French school and, you know, a variety of things like that. It was a, a really interesting dynamic that occurred yeah the pecking order of exclusion within groups right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so how did this affect your sense of identity and your sense of self as a leader this whole experience of being in the french canadian community but then not being because you weren't living there and the discrimination within the community how'd that affect you i think what it did is that i became quite introspective about who i was and what was important to me 
And I recognize that it is about reaching into the hearts of other people, experiencing them the way that they are. That's really lovely. Mm -hmm. Because you actually had that physical, biological response, and then you also had this intuitive response to the heart and the mind. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So anything else you want to add about those groups you were born into? Any other groups that affected you? I'm imagining you must have grown up in the Catholic Church. Yeah, we did grow up in the Catholic Church, and that was our social area. So oftentimes, you know, after church, we'd have people coming over um, and, you know, spending time. They would come over for breakfast, um, much to my mother's chagrin. (laughs) My father was extremely social and loved having people over. Um, And it was the people from the church as well that we often had, as well as extended family that came. And we had lots of card playing nights. But our faith certainly played a a huge role in our lives growing up and getting us through, you know, prayer certainly got us through uh, a lot of tough times that the farmers experienced back then. Yes. A real reliance on God because there's so much out of your control, right? Well, and God, for me, I mean, created each of us and we're all such amazing miracles that again my curiosity was like who are you and and where do you live and how does this come to be right and i know now that god is love and we have that within every single one of us Mm -hmm. and that's our job as people is to find that love in each other and make it shine totally i so agree with you (laughs) so um yeah (laughs) it's like there's nothing more to say let's just end the interview right there (laughs) i mean just go do it go love one another (laughs) but actually i have a few more questions so (laughs) because after you have all these experiences of the groups you you didn't choose to to belong to you just were there and you just experienced it but then you had to choose to belong to other groups as you were growing up and growing into your adulthood so what were some of those groups and cultures and how have those affected you they could be professional groups they can be um, new communities and neighborhoods where you learn to live it could have been that you also left and lived in a different region and that also has an effect Um, can be groups of friends can be hobbies too uh all sorts of things can be that you uh, discovered other people from other countries or other cultures that you didn't have association with when you were younger that then affected the way you see things. Any of those ring a bell? All of them. (laughs) I was, um, I easily got bored at my jobs. And so I would travel, I I would stay at a job for a period of time until I had learned everything I needed to learn. And then I would look for something similar, but in a different location, because I wanted to experience different people. I got to live in the Yukon, and the people there were, had a very different culture and a different way of being and, and a sense about who they were, much different than um, I grew up in Saskatchewan and much different than in Alberta. And so, you know, those are the three places that I lived in most of the time. And the work that I did was again about learning as much as I could about myself and challenging myself skill-wise while I was learning and assessing people around me. You know, so when you lived in the Yukon, for example, Anything mm-hmm. that you've adopted into the way you do things from that experience or that might have changed your thinking? Spending more time in nature. Wasn't that yeah. something you were doing already? It was, but it wasn't intentional. Um, growing up on the farm was certainly a lot of time in nature. But then when I moved to the city primarily, it didn't really matter to me. It's not, it wasn't a big thing. You know, I wasn't completely enthralled with 
regrounding myself in nature as much as I was once I lived in the Yukon. Also another experience where I lived in the mountains for a couple of years. Um, and that really instilled the need for stillness. And that was a really great experience, like seeing nature at its best, like wild animals just being themselves and you're not hunting them was really a great experience for me. Except when the bear came into camp and decided that they wanted to take everything out of my food cache. Ah. That was an experience. Chuggling <laughs> boxes of milk <laughs> and I'm throwing rocks at him and I'm yelling in French to get away. <laughs> and he's just not moving. He's quite happy. Just eating, eating all everything. that food, <laughs> everything. <laughs> everything in there. <laughs> I even shot at him, not to hit him, just to scare him. No, not no, a thing. I'm, I'm eating. Nothing disturbs me when I'm eating. Right? <laughs> so I've had some fun experiences. That's interesting because, you know, when I ask that question, people have never, nobody has ever answered to me that that experience of nature was how they become part of who they are now. But I think it's really profound because that's what's missing a lot of the decisions that are made in the world that are harmful are made because people don't are completely disconnected from the natural world. So, and, and from the effects of their actions on the natural world. So, yeah, I think this, that was very interesting. And you may have discovered something also from the people though, that you were with. Um, so like for me, I, my, although my first, my name is Marie, which is a French name, but my parents were immigrants and didn't speak French. They wanted me to have a French name and an English name so I'd fit into both official cultures. And I learned French later as an adult. So learning about the French Canadian culture and then about the multicultures in, that came from different countries with all the beautiful French that was spoken was such a discovery for me. It really made me rethink who I was linguistically and and how to fit in or not to fit in into certain groups um, from a language perspective. And did anything like that happen to you? I might not have. That could be just me projecting onto you. I've had groups, but again, it was, and it, it's really great speaking with you on this because it's bringing into realization something more about myself that I didn't know um, because it, <laughs> It's very easy to put yourself down if you're not doing what everybody else is doing. Um, and being part of a group for me is always beneficial as long as I'm learning and growing. But if the group isn't learning and growing, then I look for another group. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so as you were speaking, I'm thinking, yes, I've had that experience in a variety of groups and in a variety of different locations because I'm a life learner. I'm constantly gleaning information and I'm constantly curious about things. But if the people around me are not growing, then I leave the group. Yes. So I have learned a lot about other people because of the variety of groups I've been in. Mm -hmm. Very interesting response. So let's go to your temperament. I mean, obviously, from the way you're speaking, you're a very thoughtful person. You must have been born with that kind of thoughtfulness because it comes out in everything that you've been saying so far. But what else, <laughs> what else would you say is sort of characteristic that you, you know, people would have said, oh, yeah, that's just like Shanin, right? When she was five, she was doing that. And when she was 16, she was doing that. What, what would you say is part of your temperament that, that you're born with? Well, curiosity. Curiosity and thoughtfulness. Curiosity, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was always curious. People called me nosy. <laughs> but I wasn't being nosy. I was curious. I wanted mm -hmm. the answers. I wanted, I really wanted to understand. And I think I'm a little bit French. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and most people relate that to having a hot fire temper. And um, I certainly can have that occasionally. And I am a kind person. I love giving as much as I have to the situation or the person as, you know, to the best of my ability. And hmm. I think that's quite foundational to who I am. Yeah, that rings pretty true. So from your personality, which of course you've grown as you 
it faced obstacles and overcame difficulties and learned new things. What's been added on to your temperament? I don't mean to stump you with this. <laughs> I, I, I like I'm not sure how to add to that. <laughs> What's been added on to my temperament? Well, um, what about scientific patience. discovery? Well, patience, but all uh, science. Do you think science has been added on quite a bit? Oh, yeah. Science and understanding of the nervous system. Uh -huh. A deep respect for an individual's path. I am in awe of the journey that people have been on and how they get themselves to where they are today. Right. And it's really exciting for me to understand how they've found ways to cope or to overcome or to nourish themselves. Yes. And the impact that that has on those around them. I remain fascinated by the miracles that we all are. And from a neurological perspective, the manner in which we absorb our entire lives through the nervous system. And I haven't met anybody yet who has not had trauma. Right, because we've all been traumatized. Even if it's a, the trauma of falling off your bicycle and slitting your arm open when you were three. That's right. Yeah, uh, and ranging all the way up to being in a war-torn country and having seen your relatives machete to death in front of you and everything in between, right? Everything in between. So those traumatic experiences shape us and shape our decisions about who we're going to be and what we think of the world around us. And when we go back to the rootedness of that trauma, that's where we can make a change. That's where we can impact our going forward. Because it is trauma that dwarfs us emotionally, spiritually, in a manner that doesn't allow us to become the best version of ourselves. Unless we can use it to gain insights and transform rather than to be made small. Exactly. Until we do that piece. Once we do that piece in being aware of that it resides within us still and then allowing it to transform us. Right. And even people who have been traumatized over and over and over again can heal when they start to see how they can transform through realization of that root of Absolutely. that trauma. That's correct. Absolutely. I heard a most amazing podcast by this group of people who've been in war-torn countries, they're first responders in the front lines of armies, and they're also the first responders in healthcare. Usually the people who have to go out and take bodies off the road and that sort of thing, um, try and bring people to the hospital quickly. And because they've seen more trauma than any human being should have to endure. And they often have experienced trauma themselves, which is why they went there to begin with into that mm -hmm. profession. And so this podcast is about these people who have been the most severely traumatized and how to transform from it. It's quite riveting. And this one guy was just, I mean, I couldn't believe all the things that he'd been through from his father trying to set his family on fire in their house and getting worse from there. And he was a cocaine addict and had many other problems. And he was able to heal by going into the mountains, like what you were talking about, going into the mountains. And he found this tire and he just kept flipping this tire every day, getting stronger and stronger until, until he flipped this tire all the way up to the top of the mountain. And at that point, he had an insight into what he could do to overcome his own difficulties and, his, and say, I am bigger than the things that have been done to me. It was absolutely riveting to listen to that. I, it made me think of what you just said now, just imagining this guy turning this tire, uh, you know, and uh, gradually getting to the top of the mountain. And this is not some hill. This is a mountain. <laughs> it took mm -hmm. him a year to do this. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. It's absolutely, I mean, it is there for each one of us if we want it and if we're willing to do the work. And being open and honest enough to becoming okay with the recognition of the truth. So I want to ask you, how do you work with people? Because I think you started to explain this to me earlier on. When you work with people, you can't just say, okay, let's get to the root of your trauma because they just fall apart and, or resist you. You must have some steps. 
I do have some steps. I start with an objective assessment that I work with them. And that is the beginning of opening up to a test that, you know, it's not me telling you how I see you. And when we start with an objective assessment, oftentimes the emotionality that it can draw out in us are exactly the pieces that we need to take another look at. Mm -hmm. And then what I do uh, in a work environment is that I will go and speak with others, direct reports to a leader, because I like to work with the leaders. Um, So I'll work with direct reports and I will ask them how they perceive the communication style of their leader. How do they feel? Are they valued? Are they barked at? You know, like what, I don't give them this information. I just ask them. So tell me how your boss talks to you. Mm -hmm. And they're very willing to tell me that information. I've noticed that. (laughs) I've asked people for bullying stories and they just want to spill. (laughs) Yeah, they just want to tell you because Mm -hmm. the part of it is that they're not heard or they don't believe they're heard. And so when someone finally asks, they want to tell so they can be heard. And so they tell me, I bring this information, I compile it so that it's completely the subjective information that comes back now is random. And, but I take the points of it to the leader and I explain to them how they're being perceived and what the solutions are. And probably what the effects are to their business or their organization. Oh, very much so. So we take a look at the attrition rate and how that impacts the bottom line. And what have people said in the exit interviews as to why they're leaving and the incredible cost that that has to the corporation, not only on a dollar value, though most leaders are greatly affected by that, but also what it does culturally to the organization. And the morale. Yeah. And the morale and the trust, the, you know, the fear, does it increase or decrease all these things? When the leader recognizes the impact that they can have on the culture in their organization by their communication process, they can completely alter the culture of the organization by creating one that is rooted in fear, shifting that over to one that is rooted in trust. Right. And the leader has the power to do that. And what they have to do is to stop being disconnected from the workings of the organization. Stop being disconnected from the people. So important. Mm -hmm. Because that's where things go wrong. And I think that there's a huge disconnect that is caused by the direct reports to the leader. And the direct reports don't want to lose their job. So they're going to tell the leader what they think he wants to hear. Then the leader is living in a bubble, and yet people are leaving him or her. And then that creates a tiptoeing around within the organization. And it cannot be highly successful on all levels when that happens. That reminds me of a statement somebody made when they asked to join uh, this Facebook group that I have for supervisors. And I think guys, whoever it was, is no longer in the group, came in and left immediately, but asked this question, why do people keep leaving my organization? They seem happy. (laughs) Michael Jackson said it best. Go start with the man in the the mirror. The man in the mirror. The man in the mirror. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. Mm. So this is great. I'm sure that organizations benefit greatly from working with you. And uh, people, it's always personal and professional always go together. It's not like you have the personal in one part of you and the professional in another part and, and the business here and the communications there. It's all integrated as you went the way you see the world and animals and nature and people and science and also the way people communicate with each other. So I'm thinking you probably have had a number of experiences when what you thought as being normal was not in other people's worldviews or or the way that they saw things. You did say to me when we first met that people tell you you should just grow up. 
That must be a cultural disconnect when people say that to you. What do you think they mean when they say that? I am not 100% certain <laughs> because I think that they don't know how to have fun. Well, that's one thing I learned from the French Canadians is how to have fun. I mean, oh my gosh, if there's people around, you're having fun. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's about being authentic and being honest and being where you are can be very explosive at times. And what I mean by that is not in a negative way, but explosive in terms of great excitement and great joy and great thrill. And when I become an animated with something that's going on in my life, people are like, oh my gosh, like really? You have to be that happy. <laughs> you have to be that. And I'm like, are you kidding? This is amazing. Like, like stop with you... the happiness already. <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> You've got it. So we're getting close to the end of the interview. And when somebody hires you, what do you tell them about what's the best way to work with you? Best way to work with me is to be open first and foremost, and to understand that I am here to help you uncover the root of your trauma so that you can then become your best self. I am going to massage this out of your nervous system in a way that's safe and effective and fun. And throughout the process you're going to appreciate yourself way more and you're going to appreciate the people that get to work with you. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm like totally sold. <laughs> Oh, good. Well, you know, I, I have a program for you. And that's I, I was hoping you would. So tell me about these programs that you have and, what, and services that you offer, because there must be other people who are thinking, sign me up, sign me up, Shannon. <laughs> Where do they go? What do they do? Well, I have a great workshop that I start everybody with, mm -hmm. and it can be a workshop that we either do one-on-one -on -one or in a group. So it just depends on uh, what the individual and leader to me doesn't just mean corporation. So you could be a leader in your home or you could simply want way more for your life than it is now. And you're in charge of that. So going to my website at 7dceo.com, uh, the D stands for dimension, by the mm -hmm. way. So mm -hmm. that's seven dimension CEO. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can sign up for programs and get in touch with me there. And I would be so thrilled to work with you. Great. What are you doing in this uh, virtual um, environment right now where we can't have any physical contact? How are you doing? I'm in the process of developing workshops to help young adults uh, uncover who they are and where they should go. Oh, that's great. So many people need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else you would like to say? Well, there's probably a lot. <laughs> um, I would say that every day is an absolutely fantastic day. And it's the miracle of who we are and where we are is in this very moment right here, right now. Because we don't know if we have another moment. So live it, be it, and enjoy it. Ooh, that's a lovely way to end. Uh, so I'm going to put all your information in our show notes. And I think this was just such a joy. I mean, literally, we did a lot of laughing. Uh, but, uh, and also very profound exchange that I, I appreciate so much that you were willing to share this with the Culture and Leadership podcast listeners. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> And thank you for being such a good leader of directing things as well. You're very good at this. <laughs> I'm curious about people like you're curious about people. I think that's the main thing. I, it's just, it can, I can hardly put a lid on it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, I get it. <laughs> like if you and I got together three days later, we still would be finished. <laughs> I, totally, totally. <laughs> 
Well, thanks for joining me. And we will be um, broadcasting this shortly and you'll get a chance to hear it. Janine Brisebois was an interview that really inspired me about a holistic approach to life that starts with deep curiosity about the physical world when she experienced holding an animal heart in her hand and seeing lungs expand and understanding how the inner workings of nerves and muscles and ligaments came together. And then she added that to a really deep understanding of how to work with people and understand their physical and health issues from the context of a much greater and deeper working of the universe and the human spirit. She really inspired me to think about science in a way that I had never considered it before and to see both the micro and the macro in everything that we do. I really enjoyed this interview with Janine and I hope you will take the time to look up what she does and check out her website and see if you might be able to use her for an upcoming speaker event or to inform the work that you do. This podcast would not be possible without the expertise of our Culture and Leadership Connections production team. A big thank you and shout out to Mike Kurlander for audio production and editing. To Malvika Kathpal for the show notes. Bernadette Guadiz for online web and social media management and promotions. Celine Bayogo for design. And Kirsten Hoyer for website and branding. Thank you so much. Hey, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. Do you love these insightful and moving interviews published twice monthly for your listening pleasure? You may not know that it costs between $300 and $500 per month to pay for our podcast episodes. Shocking, but true. Well, now you can help support this podcast by showing your love with a little skin in the game real money on the Patreon website. For as little as $5 or as much as $50 a month, you can contribute to keep culture and leadership connections alive and healthy. Your donation is invaluable in helping us connect the hearts and minds of people across cultures and professions for happier and more humane workplaces. I know you will call on your inner generosity, knowing that your contribution is a practical demonstration of love and support. Check out the patreon.com slash culture and leadership connections page to see what subscription level feels right for you and find out about the special loyalty perks at each patron level. That's spelled P A T. R E O N Patreon.com slash culture and leadership connections. Thank you for your generosity.